Welcome to Off The Record. I'm your host, Marika, and I'm a dietitian, nutritionist, and recovering perfectionist. Join me each week as I bring you raw and real conversations with inspiring men and women discussing matters in health and nutrition that are often swept under the rug. Sit back, relax, pour yourself a cup of coffee or a wine, and enjoy learning from conversations that help us to understand the messiness of what it means to be a healthy and balanced. Hello and welcome back to episode two of Off the Record. Today is a solo episode and I'm going to be running you through my journey with injuries. Now, if you've been following me on social media for a while now, you'll know I am probably one of the most injury prone people that you've ever met. Um, And I've had a lot of questions over the years asking me about, you know, how do I manage my mental health and injuries? How do I keep routine? How do I essentially survive and, you know, find the motivation and bounce back from injury after injury? So this episode is diving into all of that. Um, So I hope it provides some hope for those of you who have gone through injuries in the past or are currently going through injuries Um, And also remind you that you're not alone if you are somebody who is injury prone or has had setbacks. So whether that be, you know, within um, health and fitness or within any other area of your life. So let's dive on in and get started. So to begin this episode, I thought I would explain why I believe I am so injury prone. I'm sure there is many factors, but one of the things that I think really did contribute to um, my injury proneness. I don't even know if that's a word, Um, but I was never an active child. And this, I think, shocks a lot of people because uh, at the moment, health and fitness is obviously my career. It is my passion. It is my purpose. And um, yeah, so it's quite surprising to a lot of people to hear that, you know, I didn't even get into fitness and, you know, wasn't into exercising or an active, you know, teenager or anything like that. I literally was the kid that avoided school sports days. I would fake sick on school sports days so that I didn't have to go. Um, And I think that this sort of led to me lacking coordination uh, and just really like not building that baseline muscle tone that I think you probably should build in your, you know, primary and high school years. Um, And unfortunately for me, it was just not something that I was really motivated to do. I um, like, it's not through lack of trying from my parents end or anything. They really encouraged me. I did a little bit of uh, school swimming and I did a little bit of netball, but nothing really sort of captured my attention. The other thing that I think plays a role in my injuries is uh, my hypermobility as well. Um, And obviously just generalized weakness, because as I said, I was not, you know, active growing up. I don't think I developed a good amount of muscle mass as a teenager. Um, So, yeah, I think that those sort of three things really influenced my development and my injury proneness now. So um, I guess the first major injury that I had was when I was uh, 18. I went into surgery um, to have surgery on a labral tear in my hip. Um, now that injury I actually would have had for, I think maybe three years before I got the surgery from memory, I actually didn't have a time or a point where the injury occurred. It was just one of those things that I had been in pain in my hips for quite a few years. And my mum had actually had the same injury. So she had had a labral tear in her hip, um, and finally suggested that I sort of go and explore, you know, getting an MRI and sort of seeing what it was all about. And the surgeon recommended, um, getting surgery on it. I know it's not, you know, the only, um, the only option to, uh, treating a labral tear, but it was the option that the surgeon recommended for me. Um, and I guess that was the beginning of like a series of hip injuries. Um, for me, I think most of my injuries over the last sort of 10 to 15 years, I guess, have been hip related or sort of like pelvis, uh, area injuries. I don't fortunately get too many upper body or like ankle injuries or anything like that. But the injuries sort of went from, you know, this labral tear to I tore a hip flexor on the other side. So my labral tear was on the right, tore the hip flexor on the left. Uh, And then also just a lot of generalized pain um, and sort of like, I don't even know how to describe this, like injury based pain. So like you'd be fine, like there's no current injury, but like every time you go to squat or you go to get out of the car or... um, you know, put your pants on, there would be 
discomfort through every sort of thing. And that was honestly, I'm going to say like the last 10 years of my life up until maybe I'm in a really good period at the moment, touch wood. Um, But yeah, only recently, only in the last sort of year or so. Um, And when it reached a peak in terms of my injury, I had just got back into Muay Thai and running. Um, and they are two things that I really, really enjoy doing and sort of particularly the running. Again, if you followed me on Instagram, you'd know that running for me is something that took a really long time for me to get into and a really long time for me to enjoy. Um, and so when I had essentially what I would call like my final injury, um, with my hips again, touch wood, um, it, my hip just gave way. I was in the middle of a Muay Thai class and I just went to do this kick, this kick and my hip, I just felt it like go from underneath me. And that was the second time that that had happened in the space of about 18 months. And when it, when it went, I just sort of thought to myself, I was like, Oh God, here we go again. And the like, weeks and months after that injury, I could not lift my leg to put my pants on. So I would literally have to put my hands underneath my thigh, pick up my leg with my arms, and then put my foot in between my underpants or in between my jeans so that then I could put my pants on. It was awful. Like I, I was every step in pain. And so this was the point where I was like, look, I'm done with pain. I'm done with injury. I need to find a better approach to this because something is not working. And I was sort of, again, putting together everything in the sense that, you know, I have never really built up a really good base of strength. And while strength training was something that I'd always done and always enjoyed from the age of about 22, um, I'd never really done it properly uh, and never really built, you know, good muscle mass and, you know, had really good technique and form and range of motion with like my squats and um, all of my lifts. So that was something that I sort of started to think about, you know, I needed to get cracking on. After this injury, I decided that I was going to put everything into rehab and make sure that I came out of this injury stronger than what had been, you know, in my life before. And that for me was uh, like a big commitment because I just had never really put the time, the money, the, I guess, effort into aligning everything to purely rehab and purely um the purpose of training being around preventing injury. Whereas, you know, in the sort of, again, 10 years prior, I um, had really like once I got into fitness, I'd really focus my exercise on one, having fun with my training. So that was, you know, doing high intensity and like I said, you know, getting into running and Muay Thai. Um, But I really had to sort of change the purpose of my exercise to being about injury prevention, which was a little bit depressing, might I add, because as I said, I was doing my training for fun. Um, but that process for me looked like going to a physio. Um, and I went to physio for about three months straight, um, at that point in time. So this was mid 2019, um, that I did the injury. And so sort of towards the end or like September, 2019, I'd been doing three months of physio and I was so diligent, uh, and I just saw very little improvement and it really affected my, ability to function, not just, um, like in everyday life with, you know, getting out of the car and that sort of stuff being painful, but I was actually really struggling to even have the motivation to eat well, because I am such an all or nothing person. And I know that that is not a good way to be. And I am constantly working on changing it. And actually I think this injury has helped me change that a lot. And I'll talk about that soon. Um, but at this stage I was very much an all or nothing person. And so when I wasn't training, it was like, well, and this is the worst mindset to have, but it's like, well, I'm not training. So what's the point in eating well? Um, so I just eat whatever I felt like and like not eat very well and, you know, just really not care about my diet. And again, that's just not me. So I started to lose my identity, I guess, because I'm not training, I'm not eating well, I'm not doing the things that I enjoy doing, like going for even walks because they were becoming so challenging. Um, I also gained a couple of kilos and I'll talk about, um, body image a little bit later in this episode, but, um, that was something that was a little bit uncomfortable for me. And again, on reflection, it, this injury and, you know, the series of injuries has been a really good, um, 
I guess, lesson for me in body image as well. And again, I don't think I've ever really had a bad relationship with my body, but I think as a female, uh, we all have, you know, issues from at one point to like one point in time to another, that everybody sort of goes through a period where they don't feel comfortable in their body. And um, for me, this was a, a really big period of that where I sort of felt again, out of touch with who I was and what I was doing and what I looked like. Um, yeah. And so anyway, with the physio, I sort of pulled out of it at about three months time because on reflection, like it just, again, was not working and I probably should have sought a second opinion. I ended up going into um, doing some training. I started working with uh, Luke Learman, who is from Muscle Nerds, um, and he was an absolute legend. Um, he, His wife, Zoe, I uh, love her. She is amazing. Um, but she said to me before I met with uh, Luke that not to get my hopes up, and this is literally what she said, not to get, don't get your hopes up, but Luke is a wizard. And I was like, oh God, my hopes are so high. <laughs> um, anyway, Luke did up a rehab style training program for me, which I followed with him for, again, probably six months. Um, but the initial sort of few months were very, very rehab based. And I sort of had to learn to change again, my expectation of exercise and what that was looking like. And not being disappointed with the fact that I was walking out of the gym most days and I was not sweaty. I was not sore. I was not feeling like I'd actually done anything. It was just that I was going in there and I was doing some stupid little rehab exercises because apparently they were good for me and apparently they were going to help me. And that was really challenging for me. And I honestly think that, and this is where I think gyms that really punish you with your training Um, So like those high intensity style classes and those sorts of things, I actually think they set you up for failure in the long run because you come to expect that if you're not walking out of the gym, absolutely cooked, like you can't breathe, you can't walk, then your session is a failure, which is absolutely not the way that you should be training. And fast forward to my training now, I do have sessions where, you know, I walk down the stairs at the end of a leg session and I'm sort of stumbling. But on the flip side, I also have sessions where I, and most of my sessions are sessions where I will walk out of the gym and be like, yeah, that was challenging, but I'm also fine. So that again, it was again, in hindsight, a really great thing that I learned from this injury process is that destroying yourself in the gym is not always the best option. And that learning that destroying yourself in the gym is a representation of a good workout is a really damaging, um, a really damaging sort of thought for us to be having. The other thing that I had to learn during this process was to train with pain, which previously my mindset, and again, I'm not giving advice here on this because it's such pain is such an individual thing. Um, but my mindset previously was be like, if you're in pain, then obviously you don't train because you know, you're just going to make yourself worse. Um, but after speaking to, again, a few physios and to Luke, one thing that I sort of learned was that as long as the pain didn't get worse with exercise um, and it didn't get worse the next day or the days after, then I would have to continue to train in pain, which again, is just such a challenging and confronting thing to do because you have so much doubt and uncertainty in your mind as to whether you are doing the right thing or the wrong thing. And I think that's where both myself and so many others can sort of feel really discouraged from exercise because, you know, we are taught that, you know, if you're in pain, then rest and and let your body rest. And yes, there is obviously a degree of truth to that in, you know, situations where that is so, so true and so valuable. But in some situations, doing exercise is the best thing that you can do. And obviously controlled exercises that have been, you know, provided for you, that is the best thing that you can do to rehab yourself from the pain. So that again was probably one of the bigger challenging points for me is to, I guess, overcome the fear of training when you're in pain and the fear that it's making things worse. Um, So yeah, I did that for about three months with Luke and the pain started getting better. I started getting more movement and even started running. So he was a lifesaver. Um, And the training was honestly boring training, but it was like the sort of training that I was just like, you know what, Marika, you just have to do it. It's 
not about being fit. It's not about being strong. It's just, this is the time of your life that you're just going to have to do this. Otherwise the rest of your life is going to be in pain. Um, so yeah, three months later, it, the pain had sort of gone, but this really funny thing happened. And I haven't again, spoken about this much on social media, but what happened towards the end of 2019 was that the injury kind of resolved itself, but I started to get what I would call like chronic pain. And the only way that I could sort of differentiate it from being injured is that when I had the hip injuries and when I've had injuries in the past, I could sort of say, okay, well, it hurts here and like point to somewhere on my body and it hurts when I do this. So for example, when I lift my leg, whereas towards the end of 2019, I was getting this pain where it was just, I'm aching all through my pelvis, like, and you know, my, both my hips and my lower back pretty much all of the time. And there was no sort of site that I could point to. There was nothing that, you know, when I did a movement like this, it was making it worse or better. Um, So that really concerned me because again, I was not able to walk as much. I was waking in the night in pain. I was having to take painkillers quite regularly. Um, And yeah, I was not sleeping. I think I was actually looking through my journal. Um, I love journaling and I'm going to have to talk about that later, but um, another episode. Um, I was looking through my journal from this time. So it would have been yet yeah, beginning of 2020 and looking at my entries. And I was saying in there that there was about three nights in a row that I had between sort of two to four hours sleep a night because I was waking up with a pain. And just looking at that was just eye opening that that's how bad it got that I literally could not sleep because of this pain. Um, and obviously my mental health started to decline at this time because, you know, I wasn't sleeping. I wasn't exercising. I wasn't eating well. I wasn't doing the things that I loved. Um, and I really felt like I lost my identity of myself. And I think that again, upon reflection, one of the things that I've learned about this is not to put all your eggs in one basket. And what I mean by that is that If you put your identity, like if you identify yourself as, you know, somebody who is fit and active and goes to the gym, when you lose that, because, you know, we're all probably going to get injured at one point or another, when you lose that, you lose your sense of self. And that is a really awful thing to lose. Um, So, yeah, I used to look in the mirror at that time. And again, like I said, there was physical changes as well. So I look in the mirror and just not even recognize who I was. Um, I was yeah very low mood. I was very anxious all the time. I wasn't sleeping in the pain. So it was just, it was awful, honestly. One of the questions that I uh, was often asked about and still am asked about injuries is mentally, how do I cope with, um, with them? Like, and how do I find the motivation to sort of, uh, show up to the gym and to come back every time? And I would say mentally, I like I explained just before, I, I did not cope. I was really struggling. And I think that the thing that really ended up helping me was uh, going to my GP and reaching out and engaging a psychologist and sort of, again, unpacking all of this sort of mentality around identifying myself with what I was doing. And so unpacking that and sort of unlearning that I was so much more than what I was doing and what my body was physically capable of. And I think that this is a bit off the track, but I think one of the things we learn when we're learning positive body image is that we think about our body. So for example, when you have poor body image, you are not liking what you're seeing or what you're feeling or anything like that. And what a lot of people will say in the body image space is, well, rather than think about what your body looks like, think about what your body can do. And I actually now disagree with that because you can have a positive body image without having a fully functioning body. And so that was the thing that I really had to also unlearn is that just because my body wasn't functioning doesn't mean that I am not worthy, does not mean that my body is broken. It does not mean that I can't do anything. Um, So that was one of the sort of mental struggles that I had. And I highly recommend if you're going through um, injuries and having mental health um, side effects of it, that you do engage a psychologist if you can get access to one. Um, They are fantastic. Actually, scrap that. I recommend everybody engages with the psychologist. It is just one of the best things that you will ever do for your well-being. Um, 
Mentally, the other challenges for me, so the motivation to show up every day to the gym and do this boring (laughs) rehab, I think I honestly had to just say to myself that just show up, just do five minutes, just do the bare minimum and make it a habit of turning up to the gym. And that for me was one of the things that really did help me is to be making sure that I was doing all of my rehab at the gym. Whereas if I was doing it at home, then I was not um, following through with it. So I'd do like five minutes and be like, eh, just turn the TV on and watch it, even though I can do the TV and do it, but whatever. (laughs) Don't tell me that. Um, So for me, it was, okay, I go to the gym at six o'clock every morning and I do my rehab or I get on the bike and do five, 10, 15 minutes, whatever I feel like of writing so that I was just doing something and I was just creating those patterns. But it honestly was that decision that I said earlier that was about, this is the last time I really want to do this. I don't want to have to go back through injury over and over and over and over again. And I want to really bring like build that base strength so that I don't have to do this. And for me, that also meant then having to drop my ego, which I think in the gym, as much as I didn't think I was a numbers person in the gym, like I don't really care about how much weight I'm squatting or deadlifting. And I never really have. But when someone tells you, I remember Luke watching me squat, I think it was for the first time. And he was like, oh, and um, I thought my squat was pretty good. It was awful. Um, My squat's pretty good now. I, I, I rate it. Um, but I really had to, again, drop my ego and sort of go back to body weight squats and learn how to yeah, squat again and move my body again. And again, that's not an easy thing to do. It's quite challenging and you really do need, I believe the support of somebody who knows how to teach that. And whether that be through like an online program where somebody's actually, um, you know, teaching you the specifics of, you know, how to squat and the, the sort of cues to look for. Um, and squatting is obviously only one movement. There's multiple of them. Um, and there's also plenty of YouTube videos that you can sort of look at for technique on these things. But if you can afford it, I highly recommend getting a good trainer, um, ideally somebody with like an exercise physiology background who really does know um, the ins and outs of human physiology and movement. Now, I know I'm going to be asked this question, so I'm going to answer it straight off the bat. I mean, is it really straight off the bat when we're 20 minutes into an episode? But um, I have also been asked before about, you know, did I change my diet during this period in time? And um, yeah, like what happened with my weight during this period of time? Um, So please, if talking about weight and diet triggers you, then you might want to switch off at this point in time. Um, But I did change my diet slightly. As I said, I was not eating well um, at this point in time. And I really wanted just to start eating better and to, as I said, start building more muscle mass. So with the help of Luke, we sort of um, just set some goals for me in terms of um, how much protein I should be having and how to build up my calorie intake so that I was building muscle mass. So that was in itself a quite challenging thing. Um, And again, I don't consider myself somebody who's ever really had a bad relationship with food. I think I've sort of always had a really good relationship with food, but again, being confronted with increasing your calories is a really confronting thing. And again, I don't know whether it's just, again, being a female or what it is, but the thought of just pushing up week by week, week by week, eating more and more and more and more, there is this fear around, well, am I going to get fat? And the reality of it is, is, well, does it matter if you gain a few kilos, if it means that you're not in pain and that you can move and walk and all of this? And that's just what I had to keep sort of telling myself that, This is so much more important than aesthetics. And the goal really had to switch from being around aesthetics to being around function. Um, So that was something that I did consider. And I did actually track my protein calories and those sorts of things for a period of time. It's not something that I recommend other people to do. um, because uh, It's something that I would only recommend if you know you are 100% fine with tracking and don't become an obsessive person. If you are somebody who obsesses over calories and those sorts of things, do not track. And we're going to do a whole other episode on that because there is so much to talk about there. 
Um, but for me, tracking my calories, I knew it was a very short period of time. I knew it was for a specific goal that I was working towards and that it was going to help me achieve that outcome of um, reassessing my diet in terms of protein intake and eating more food to fuel my body. So it ultimately was a good thing for me, but it did take a lot of time and a lot of patience as well. One of the other questions that I have been asked numerous times relating to my injuries is how did I build um, or rebuild trust in my body and deal with the fears of re-injuring? Um, and I don't even know if I have a right answer to that because I think it's a very slow and gradual process and it's just learning that learning your limits and learning what, like where you can push your body and where you can't. And you can really only do that through trial and error. Um, and like I said, if you can get the guidance of a, um, trained exercise physiologist or a coach who, you know, specializes in injury rehab, then I would highly recommend, um, you know, seeking out that or a, a physiotherapist, uh, somebody that you really trust, uh, and that you believe is really on board with your way of sort of managing the injuries as well. So someone that you feel like is on your team, um, and yeah, showing up and being consistent and learning when your body sort of sends you signals. So when, you know, when my body would flare up a bit more and I get a little bit more pain, I would sort of then dial it back or, you know, I'd report back and sort of go, okay, well, this exercise is obviously not working for me. Is it this because of this, this, like what, what's going on here? Um, so I think one of the best ways to deal with fears is to like face them head on. So not so much about like, you know, just going in and destroying yourself in the gym, but sort of like stepping that line and going, okay, well, you know, I'll try run around the block, which might be, you know, 300 meters. And then I'll wait till tomorrow and see how I feel. And honestly, that was what I did. I remember the first run I did around the block. It was, I think it's my block is about 500 meters around, or maybe not even that. Um, and I remember getting back and I was just elated. I was so stoked that I was able to run around the block without pain in that moment and then stopping and going, okay, well, I probably could keep running now because I'm not in pain, but this is the first time I've run in six or 12 months or whatever it was. Um, so I'm just going to stop now and wait and see for the next two days if things get worse. And that's really how I sort of started to rebuild my running. Um, and I've also since found a really good physio who sort of helped me to, uh, I guess, build up that running fitness again. And that was through a lot of interval training. And again, that's something that I can talk about on a separate episode with the running, because I feel like there's a whole lot there. I am not a runner, but we got here. <laughs> um, but yeah, all in all, like the outcome of these injuries, um, and again, touch wood, I'm in a good space now with injuries. Um, actually, I did my shoulder about three months ago, which was freaking annoying, but my hips, I'm squatting deeper than I ever have before. And I feel like I have so much strength in like the depths of, you know, the squat and I have so much um, <laughs> and this is not going to resonate with anyone except for people who have had hip injuries, but like I can do mountain climbers without like it just feeling like it's grinding and crunching up in my hips. Um, and I can get out of the car and I can cross my legs and I can put my pants on. So they're all the positives that have come out of this. And I think my key takeaways from this episode is that firstly, if you are going through injury and if you feel like the world is collapsing around you because of those injuries, I so see you and I so hear you and I have so been there. It is it, it, injury and, and in particular, I'm going to say back pain is one of those things that I don't know, but there is, well, I mean, you got your spinal cord. I was going to say there's a direct link between your back and your brain and it just screws with your brain and makes you feel so depressed. Um, so please know that if you are going through that, that one, you are not alone and two, that reaching out for help in as many ways as possible. And those ways I believe, and this is what was worked best for me is, um, getting a psychologist. If you feel that that is something that's um, going to be beneficial for you, finding a physiotherapist, um, if that's something again, that you have access to, um, and looking at your training technique. So again, if you can get a coach or, a um, exercise physio physiologist, or even just starting to look at some technique based, um, YouTube videos online. There's heaps of really good ones out there. Um, and I might even see if I can, um, at the end of this episode, uh, link a few good people on YouTube that you might be able to watch some technique videos from. 
Thank you so much for tuning into today's episode. I hope you learned something about me or about um, how to manage injuries and manage setbacks. Um, If you enjoyed the episode, I would so love it if you could share it by taking a screenshot and sharing on social media and tagging me at Marika Day. Um, Because we are a new podcast, I would also be so grateful if you could support this podcast by subscribing on your favorite podcasting platform and leaving a rating and review. Thank you so much, guys. And as always, if you have any suggestions, please send me a DM on Instagram. Uh, And next week we will be back with a guest episode. So I will chat to you guys then. Bye.